All right, Physics 3030, The Universe. This is Lecture 11, and today we're going to talk about gravitational waves, and we're in, then we're going to talk about quantum gravity. And we'll talk about gravitational waves, the detectors that we use currently to try and look for gravitational waves. And we're going to start talking about mixing quantum mechanics and general relativity. I'll show you an example of something like that. <clears throat> something you may have heard of called Hawking radiation. And then we'll talk a little bit about quantum gravity and the quest for quantum gravity. Okay, so last lecture we talked a little bit about general relativity and some of the consequences of general relativity, such as black holes and the precession of the perihelion of Mercury and some some other things like that. And one of the things that I pointed to that I talked about a little bit <clears throat> was gravitational waves. And this was sort of a surprise that this was a consequence of the theory of general relativity. And it really means the waving of space-time. So the actual fabric of the universe, right? This is what, I'll put this in quotes. Fabric of the universe is what is waving. That's the thing that's oscillating back and forth. <clears throat> and this is a sort of weak, weak field approximation is what it's known as. And what that just means is that um, we're really looking at the waves far away from sources. Okay, and there's been a lot of work recently in a field called numerical rel relativity to try and understand what the what different types of sources, what kind of waves different types of sources give us. So we're looking at chaotic systems where we might have a black hole, a black hole, and something like a neutron star orbiting around each other. Okay, and as they orbit, if I go forward in time, what happens is <clears throat> these these give off, they give off waves, wave fronts, okay, and the system starts to um, sort of collapse in on itself. The waves, there's energy given off by the waves, just like any wave really gives off gives off energy. I always think of this, these two things spinning around each other sort of looks like ripples in a pond as you as you look off. But over here, back over here again, um, <clears throat> The, the black hole, because you have a loss of energy, the black hole and the neutron star get closer and closer to each other. And eventually, they're going to merge into just one thing. And since this is a black hole already, it'll just be one big spinning black hole. Okay. And once it's a big spinning black hole, you, you don't get waves. So in this picture, you're still getting waves, right? And in this picture with the black hole that's spinning, there are... Uh, no waves, no gravitational waves. And the reason for that is if I look at this math, it's because of the uh, rotational symmetry. This is not the case in uh, electromagnetism. All you need is one source and you just be moving around and you get waves. For general relativity, um, if if a system is uh, rotationally symmetric, so rotational, rotationally symmetric equals no gravitational waves. Okay, and it's this <clears throat> field of numerical relativity that we need to to try and understand what these waveforms look like. Okay. And the reason that we're looking for these waveforms is A, uh, so let's, let me write a little list here. So, um, they haven't been found. This is rotational waves we're talking about here now. They have not been found yet. Okay, so we're looking for them. 
And the reason they haven't been found yet is they're very weak. Okay, talking about uh, motions of space time on a sub micron scale. So, talking about s stuff that's very, 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 very small. Okay, micron is a thousandth of a millimeter. So, talking about pretty small movements. And the idea, the, the way that these um, the way that these change is the way the way the waves move is if I had a circle, okay, if I have a circle of stuff, and I have my gravitational waves sort of coming towards the circle, okay. This is actually the now this red line is movement of space time, right? The the circle can move in a couple of different ways. There's two different modes. There's one mode where the we call it the plus mode where Either the this circle is gets deformed right to left or up to down, up and down. Okay. So the video of this, I'll try and find a uh, a video online of this to show you guys. Is this this circle sort of squ squashing in the up down direction, and then it goes back to its circle position, and it squashes in the sort of right and left direction. Okay. Then there's another mode. Okay, this is called the plus mode. Okay. And then there's another mode where instead of uh, squishing in that direction, it'll squish sort of diagonally like this or diagonally like this. And it goes through that circle in between on both of these, right? So it'll squish this way or it'll squish this way. And I think I can, and this is called the um, cross mode. Okay, and that's how we uh, are looking for these. So this is what we know the effect of these gr these gravitational waves should be from general relativity, and so we 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 start looking for these. Okay, and there's a the first question to ask is why. look for them. Okay, I think this is a pretty good question. And it's always a this is always the uh, funding agency's question. All right, so that's sort of why I look for them. And number 1 is they're predicted uh, but not found. Okay? So this is sort of like why climb the mountains because it's there. Also, because we want to we want to corroborate general relativity. We want to continue to corroborate. It's really the only prediction of general relativity that hasn't been tested. So we just want to kind of put that nail in the coffin of questions about general relativity. And there are actually other types of gravitational theories out there. There are theoretical physicists whose job it is sort of to make make up new theories and test the old ones. And they have different modes besides this. Uh, plus mode and this cross mode, which I think is really interesting. But anyways, um, so number one, why look for, uh, number one, why look for them? Because it would help corroborate general relativity because we're scientists and we like to look for new things. Two is that they can tell us about the universe. Okay. And remember back when I, we were talking about light, uh, Gravitational waves are, I mean, there's light waves and there's gravitational waves. And gravitational waves are a whole other source of information. The only way that we can see the universe now is, let me write this out a little clearer here. The only way that we can see the universe now is through light or in the effect of objects that we can see through light. This is an entire new window uh, into the universe, okay, using gravitational waves. And they're weak, so we're still trying to f even see them. And once we see them, that's going to be great, but then we want to use them to look at other objects. And there's some interesting properties of gravitational waves. Um, one, uh, one big one is that they're n not strongly affected 
uh, by passing through matter. Right, so uh, I know through is spelled wrong, but running out of room over here. Um, so they are very, very, very affected by the source, but once they kind of propagate out, they can pass through things really, really easily. They're still lensed, like light is, gravitationally lensed, but they don't, they don't see dispersion. Like light from the center of our galaxy is really hard to see because the light has to go through all this dust to get to us, and gravitational waves are not affected by that. So that's a, that's a pretty nice thing about these gravitational waves. So it might make it really easy to see some stuff. And again, just a new, whole new source of information about the universe. Okay. Now I want to talk about how we would see these waves. Okay. So <clears throat> here are pictures of two observatories. Uh, they're both called LIGO. There's some other ones, but this is... Uh, LIGO stands for Laser Interferometry um, Gravitational Wave Observatory. Okay, of course, gravitational wave is made into one word. I have lots to say about astronomers and astrophysicists and their acronyms, whatever. But these are laser interferometers. And what they are, so this one is in, on the left, is in Hanford, Washington. Okay, so that's actually pretty close to us. And this one is in Livingston, uh, Louisiana. Okay, and the reason we have them pretty far apart is because hopefully when they both start looking for signals, we can use, because you can't point them, uh, because you can't point these things are basically just pointed straight up. Um, because you can't point them, you need them to sort of be pointed in different directions so that we can tell where a wave came from. And I think, I think there's something like two kilometers long, and the length of the arms, uh, let's just write different things down, but the, the length of the, of the arm uh, affects the sensitivity. Okay, and the as L goes up, the sensitivity also goes up. Okay, so that's a good thing to know about these. And the way these work is <clears throat> these arms are perpendicular to each other. Okay. And at the ends there are mirrors. And in the center there's a half mirror. Let me write that red here. There's a half mirror. And what you do is you shine light through this mirror and half of the light goes this way, half of the light goes that way. Okay. And then when the light comes back off that mirror and it comes back off that mirror, the light goes this way. And this is the, where the sensors all live. Okay. And these interferometers, that's what this is called, and an interferometer is a, it measures interference. And I'm not going to go too deeply into this, but the interference of light has to do with, if I have waves, two sets of waves, okay, and they're, if they're in phase, like this, so the humps and the troughs all meet together, then the new wave I get interferes in such a way that it's bigger, okay? And then there's the opposite. So instead of, here's, here's one, if, um, if the blue wave was completely out of phase, so the humps and troughs were opposite each other, right? Then that wave would just be a flat line, okay? And that would be destructive interference. And then there's all this stuff in between. Okay, and that's what this interferometer does is it measures interference. Okay, so that's a, sort of number three over here, measures this interference. And this interference is, of course, really sensitive to how far these waves have traveled. And so um, the length of these arms, the length of the arms here, okay, 
tells you about what the, the uh, pattern is going to look like. And you can see that if a wave came through here and made, what would it do if this was like that circle? It would make one shorter, one shorter, and one a little bit longer. Okay, and that would change the interference pattern. Um, and so that's how these things measure measure light. And these two were built by the U.S. Okay, there's one in Italy called Virgo, and there's another one somewhere else in Europe. And then um, there are a bunch of different. <clears throat> uh, um, plans to make different ones. Let me uh, let me pull up another one here. This is a poster for another uh, <clears throat> another interferometer type uh, detector, and this one is called Lisa. Okay, and it's a laser interferometer space antenna. Okay, and this one would live in space, and I think these are something like sixty thousand. These would be sixty thousand kilometers away from each other. Okay. And now instead of having um, a kind of plus sign interferometer, we have this triangle, and these things sort of orbit around the Earth, and, <clears throat> and it's the same idea. You have light moving back and forth between them, and they're very sensitive to the changes in how far away from each other they are. And because they're so far apart, um, they're more sensitive. Not to mention that it's out in space. Something I didn't mention before is LIGO, they have a lot of noise. And Lisa has noise too, but it's a different sort of noise. LIGO has noise from like trucks driving by because, you know, you're looking at these vibrations, right? And so a semi-truck driving by or little tiny earthquakes or whatever will ch change the detector. And so you need to, um, you need to figure out how uh, to get through all that noise to figure stuff out. And there's some, there's some, things up here that talk about different uh, types of sources of black holes, okay? Uh, so supermassive black holes or, you know, something falling into a supermassive black hole, that's sort of like this compact object capture. Um, two different black holes rotating around each other, that's what these pictures are. Uh, then there's like white dwarf binaries, so just any kind of really, really dense objects rotating around each other. Um, would give you neat signals for LISA. And this signal down here, this is sort of what one of these in-spiral signals looks like. And the idea of that is, what's happening is, you have these two things kind of rotating around each other. They're giving off waves. And I remember how I said, it'll eventually go to where it's just one thing in the center once they collide with each other. And that's what's happening here. They get closer and closer, so the frequency gets um, higher and higher. The wavelength gets smaller and smaller. Right? They get higher and higher, and then at some point they just collapse into each other, and then they r and then it rings down, right? And then it's just one sort of straight line like this, okay? And I want to I want to not show you. I want to demonstrate to you what something like this might hear uh, sound like. So this is a, a picture of. Um, <clears throat> A wave down in the right hand corner here you can say hx and h plus those are the two different modes of what you would hear so this is one of those modes and now what we've done is we take this frequency and we and the amplitude and we put it into a range where human hear, ears can hear it so this is what it's gonna this is what it would sound like so it's this is now, this is over the course of millions of years, you would hear this get faster and faster and faster, right? So we've kind of compressed this again into a way that we can hear it. So this is all in spiral. The merger and the ring down are going to go by really, really quickly, okay? So I'll, I'll be quiet for that part. So we're getting faster and faster and faster. And then it's gone. I love that. That's pretty pretty cool. So that is um, <clears throat> sort of a demonstration. Again, it's a an, little bit of an analogy, right? This is, ex but that's exactly the waveform. It's just compressed in, into a frequency uh, and amplitude that humans can hear it. Okay. So that's what we're looking for with these gravitational waves. Um, so that said, I want to sort of move on to uh, the next the next topic. I want to introduce the idea of mixing quantum mechanics with general relativity through some items from the news. Uh, may, you may, some of you may have remembered from a couple of years ago, <clears throat> there's an ID, 
idea that the Large Hadron Collider, this huge, huge particle accelerator in Europe and Switzerland, might somehow cause black holes, right? So there's there's things like Earth, you hear Earth go gobbling black holes, might threaten the Earth's very existence, right? These are, this is in the BBC News, so these are pretty credible uh, science articles. I love this picture. There's a black hole inside of the LHC just about to consume the entire universe, right? Okay, well, particle accelerators have everything to do with quantum mechanics. And black holes have everything to do with general relativity. And I'll tell you right now, kind of the punchline here is that there really is no theory of quantum gravity yet, fully quantum theory of gravity. And so uh, well, we're going to talk about how quantum mechanics helps us <clears throat> and helps us show that there are there's no way that a black hole could be f could be made that can gobble the universe. Now I'm going to talk about one different way. Now there's all a, a bunch of other science that says that a particle physics science that says you basically the energy of the <clears throat> large hadron collider will not ca cause black holes. You need much much higher energies, and and in fact we see energies trillions of times larger than the large hadron collider trillions of times larger uh, from cosmic rays. And these rays hit the Earth every day. And we can detect them and we know they're hitting trillions of times bigger than this is the biggest machine, the most energetic machine that humans have ever been able to build, right? Trillions of times bigger, we have stuff hitting the, the Earth. Some of Sometimes they hit us, okay? And they are not causing black holes on the Earth. So this is, that's one whole thing. But I want to talk about a whole other thing, which is this idea of how, uh, how quantum mechanics can sort of help us here. Okay, let's move to this next slide. Okay, so... The first, first idea is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Okay, this is a quantum mechanical thing. It's actually something that you get from waves. Uh, and it's the wave nature of light that gives us this. There's a more popular version of this that is the uncertainty in the momentum times the uncertainty in the position is less than or equal to h bar over t. Okay. And... I'm just going to do a little bit of digression here about the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. If I think about it from this perspective of, of momentum and position, right? Think about if I took two different pictures of a bullet speeding by, right? A lot of you have probably taken uh, pictures of water, where you can take a picture of water and you take a fast shutter speed, then you just get the water frozen in time. And if you take a slow shutter speed, then you get the water kind of melded together and flowing and you just get this idea more of flow. So the first option would be I take a picture of a bullet, okay, and it's just speeding by. And I know that it's going, I know it's going in this direction, but I get a fast enough shutter speed that I catch it perfectly still and it's perfectly clear, right? And I know exactly, I know exactly what its moment, or sorry, what its position is, but I have no information about its momentum. Why? Because I don't know how fast it's going. The picture doesn't tell me anything about how fast it's going. All I know is that my shutter speed was fast enough to get a still shot of it. Okay, So I know a lot about position. But I could take another picture, right? And remember that, hopefully, remember that momentum is mass times velocity. I know the mass of the bullet, so what I really need to know is what the velocity of the bullet is. And I could take a picture here. And if I took it blurry enough, what would happen is I'd get a picture with a bullet just kind of smeared out over some, some distance here, okay? And if I took a measurement from the tip of the bullet here to the tip of the bullet there, and I knew what my shutter speed was, velocity is the change in distance over the change in time, where that's my, now that's my shutter speed, Right, that's my shutter time, how long the shutter was open, and that's just this, this measurement right here. Okay. Now I know the velocity. I can tell you the momentum because I know the mass of the bullet when I started, so I know everything about momentum. Okay. 
but I don't know anything really about position. I knew I know sort of where it started and where it ended, but I don't know where where is the bullet in this picture is not a very good question. It's not a really well-defined question. Ah, it was here and there, it's here sometimes, and it's here there, but in the picture, it's really hard to tell. That's the sort of crux about what the uncertainty principle is, okay? These deltas are not changes like, like this is. These deltas mean how much I don't know about this, okay? And this is all limited by our favorite quantum mechanical constant, which is called Planck's constant, and h bar is Planck's constant divided by 2 pi. It doesn't really matter. But what it says is, if I know the, I can only know these two things. If I know, if I have information about x, the more information about, this is, a, these are an indirect um, relationship. So the more I know about x, the less I know about p. If I know more about p, I know less about x. That's what this tells us, okay? Now, there's Actually, special relativity gives us the re this result. Um, the same relationship between the energy of a particle and, and the amount of time. Okay. And this idea actually leads to um, an idea that we have pair production. Now, remember this idea about pair production we talked about when we were talking about particles, right? Where I can have <clears throat> sort of some photon just plugging along, and then out comes two particles, okay? And this photon has to just have enough energy that it can give me the mass of an electron and a positron, okay? And th so if I have a, a photon moving along with some amount of energy, then I can get those two things. Now, the crazy thing is this relationship over here says that I can get some amount of energy some amount of energy for a certain amount of time, okay? And the more energy, the less time. But that means I can get a bunch of energy. I can just only have it for a short amount of time. If I look at how much it, how much, uh, remember, Einstein tells us that energy is equal to mc squared. I look at the mass of an electron, okay? And actually, I think I did this calculation for the mass of two electrons. And if I look at how long I can have that for, I can have that amount of energy for about 10 to the negative 22 seconds, which is not a very long amount of time, but it's a finite amount of time. It's not a, it's not zero. Okay. And so I can have this amount of time, which means that going back up to this picture here, out of nothing, out of this great, I, I, I like to put it this way, this great mortgage derivative in the sky, right? I can get an electron and a positron for free. The only clincher is, right, I can only have them for some short, uncertain amount of time before they have to pop back out of existence and give me back that energy to this sort of bank in the sky. So this is a crazy, crazy idea, right? Well, we know this to be true. This is called the vacuum energy, the vacuum fluctuation energy, okay? And how this kind of plays itself out in the next slide here is that if I have a black hole, all right, and I have this sort of pair production, this vacuum pair production, where I kind of pop out of existence, pop into existence, and then pop out of existence in a little explosion, giving that energy back, okay? This kind of happens all the time. It's happening all everywhere around us. And it specifically happens really close to the edge of a black hole. Now, I'm gonna tell you, this is an analogy, again, and you can do the math for this, and it's a very pretty, it's a pretty complicated um, calculation to see what's really going on here. But <clears throat> the idea is that this is the this analogy idea is that because of these this pair production, every once in a while I have pair production happen, and in that tiny little amount of time, in that tiny little amount of time, one of these guys might get trapped behind the horizon of the black hole. Okay, and that guy falls into the black hole, and then there's this other one that's sitting out. Well, if this one is traveling in the other direction and this one gets trapped by the black hole, then I get a particle, okay? And this is called Hawking radiation, named after Stephen Hawking, who figured it out, okay? And <clears throat> what actually happens is that since I have some amount of energy, 
from this, the mass of this electron here, okay, then where did that energy come from? It's not so much where it came from, but really who pays for it? <laughs> That's how I like to think for it. Who pays for it? And if it was a mortgage derivative, it would be the taxpayer. <laughs> and if it's a black hole, it's going to be the black hole, if it's near a black hole. That's the answer. The black hole is who pays for it. And so the mass of the black hole goes down just by the mass of an electron or by the energy equivalent of a photon or by whatever this black hole is emitting. Okay. Now this is crazy, right? Because nothing's supposed to be allowed to really escape from a black hole. But this is, this is a process here where you can see where it's not so, so much that something's escaping, it's that something's going into the black hole. Okay. So. Whoop. Now, this saves us. So. Hawking radiation saves us because it shows how so black holes get smaller and eventually radiate all their mass in the form of some sort of energy and sort the form of this black in the, in the form of this Hawking radiation well they get smaller and smaller they they're always emitting this now what ends up happening is that uh, big black holes gravity wins the idea here is that they pull in more energy and this is actually in the form of the CMB Right? Because even if a black hole is out there by itself and there's nothing else that can fall into the black hole, there's cosmic microwave background radiation. And this is th this calculation that I'm about to um, sketch for you is done just using the amount of energy falling into a black hole from cosmo cosmic microwave background radiation. And so they pull in more energy uh, than they emit. Okay, but for a small black hole, Hawking radiation wins, and they emit more energy than they pull in. They're just not strong enough, and so even with the amount of CMB that they're digging in, the small black holes irradiate more. And it actually turns out that uh, the, yeah, the smaller they are, the smaller they are, the more they actually emit is the way that this goes. So maybe I should write this. Emission goes up as size goes down. Okay. And if you have something, the, the equilibrium point for this is, is about an earth mass black hole okay and an earth mass black hole I mean that's pretty big and that's not something we would ever be able to make in a particle accelerator so if and this is a big if so I'll write it as a big if <laughs> if we made a black hole it would almost immediately evaporate anyways and it would just really look like the same emission of particles that we had in the uh, in the particle accelerator anyways okay so you can tell all your friends that we're okay we're not going to make a black hole that's going to suck the entire universe into it or the entire earth into it okay so that's what that explains is for. Now this is sort of, and Hawking radiation is this idea where we sort of mix together this, these ideas of quantum mechanics, these ideas of black holes. Okay, and that's great, but 
we really want a full theory of quantum gravity. Okay, and oh. this is a subject near and dear to my heart. This is what I study. And we want a full theory of quantum gravity for a number of reasons. Um, one is to answer questions about whether we're going to be able to, whether we're going to make a black hole that's going to suck us in, suck the entire Earth in. Those are pretty important questions, right? We don't want to make something that ends up destroying all of humanity. Okay, so I'll, I'll put down maybe number one safety. Um, but really, I would put down curiosity as well. And curiosity is, you know, how the world works. Hopefully a lot of you are in this class because you want to answer this question. Okay. And <clears throat> so we want to try and finish this up. So in, in some way, it's an idea of neatness, right? We have all of these theories. You know, we've got uh, particle physics that describes three of the forces really well in a quantum mechanical way. Quantum mechanics kind of lives here, right? We have general relativity that tells us about gravity on a big scale. But we want to know about general relativity on a small scale. And that's where you really see quantum mechanics. You really see it on a small scale, on this particle scale. Okay. And so, you know, this is why we're looking, we want to try and understand quantum mechanics quantum gravity. Now, there are a number of attempts to describe a theory of quantum gravity. There are, uh, so maybe use Lee Smolin words, such as routes to uh, quantum gravity. Okay. And one of them is through this idea of unification. Okay, and remember I was talking about unification when I was talking about the uh, early universe. And the idea is that uh, all the forces were once one force. And this may seem like an alien idea, but remember that electricity and magnetism were thought to be different forces. They turned out to be the same one. Uh, I, uh, Salam and Weinberg in the 70s realized that the weak force and the electromagnetic force could actually be combined into something called the electroweak force. So this idea and theme of unification is, is one that has <clears throat> a lot of tread in, uh, in physics and in theoretical physics. And so the idea is how can we make everything one force? Okay. And the, by far the most popular unification uh, strategy that actually comes close to uh, describing gravity is something called string theory. Okay. And this is, string theory is, I'm just going to touch on this really quickly and we can um, go to the discussion board to talk about this or I can definitely answer questions if you have more, but I'm not going to spend too much time. But the idea of string theory kind of came out from, well, again, here's an analogy. Remember that we have these forces that are proportional to one over R squared, right? So the electromagnetic force is proportional to one over R squared. The gravitational force is proportional to one over R squared, right? And this theory of particle physics really talks about a particle. And the idea of a particle is that it has no radius. Okay. Now, if I put the idea of a particle into this force, I get one over zero which is really bad, right? This is undefined. If you try and put that into your calculator and it's just going to balk at you. Okay. And it just goes to infinity and it doesn't make any sense. Okay. And so the idea behind string theory is say, okay, nothing's infinity. We don't get an infinite force in the universe. So instead of, um, instead of saying that things are a point particle, make them a string. And that string can be either some length or it can be a closed string. 
okay? And that gets rid of the problems that we have because of this because of this zero, this one over r squared. Now there's there's a lot more complicated math behind this. Where you, but you, in the end, you still get infinity. Making it a string uh, fixes a lot of this. But there's some complications. Okay. Um, actually, there's some really neat things. First of all, in string theory, what ends up happening is that the vibrations or modes of the string describe the physics that's going on and the type of particle. So, you know, I have open strings and closed strings and strings that are vibrating one way and open, open strings that are vibrating one way and closed strings that are vibrating one way. And all these different modes and vibrations tell us about different particles. And one of them is actually the graviton, right? Now, we haven't mentioned the graviton. Well, I think we mentioned it a little bit when I was talking about particles. But one of them turns out to look exactly like how the graviton is predicted to look. Okay, And the graviton would be the particle, right? This is the particle equivalent of a gravitational wave. We just got done talking about gravitational waves. Remember that photons are just the particle equivalent of light, light waves. Okay, So string theory sort of we get gravity out of this. But the problem is that there's a couple of interesting things. One is that the only way that string theory really can work is if it lives in 10 dimensions. Now this seems odd, okay? But um, there are lots of ways to describe how these strings can live in seven or in 10 dimensions. And we only just see the four of them, time and the three space dimensions. And, one way of thinking about that is if the, those dimensions are really small, they might be really hard to see. Those other, it would be six that are missing. And one of the great examples of this is if I look at a clothesline, right, from far away, it looks like a string. And a string is really just, is really sort of like a one-dimensional thing. But if I look at that string up close, I notice that the string is really some two-dimensional surface, right? That I can walk around if I wanted to. So there's a whole other dimension to it. So from far away, that dimension of being able to walk around it, right? So the surface of it is two-dimensional. Obviously, the whole thing is three-dimensional. But the surface of it is two-dimensional, and it's hiding if, I, if I'm looking at it from really far away because it looks like a small dimension. That's the idea of where these dimensions can hide in string theory. Okay, So this is one of the big proponents, and I just wanted to sort of talk to you a little bit about it. It is quantized because we have these particles, and we're trying to understand um, how they work. And string theory is great. Unfortunately, it has a difficult time making predictions. Um, we still get sort of infinity where we should be getting numbers, and um, they're working actually. They're getting pretty close to the point of making uh, predictions, but they're making they would be making predictions for giant plasmas of quarks, where these you have these there's a there's this thing called REC, which is the really heavy ion collider, and it it basically throws gold nuclei at each other. Huge, huge nuclei with tons of gluons making this gluon plasma. And that's where they're getting close to actually making some predictions. Let's see. If I can... Yeah, perfect. So the next, so that's one route to quantum gravity, it's sort of through unification. Well, the other one is sort of obvious, which is quantize general relativity, okay? And this, um, <clears throat> this is a, this is the way that we got to all of the other particle physics, which I'm not sure if I told you or not, but the way we got to all those other particle physics ideas, well, the strong and the weak force are really only quantum. We only really see them on a small scale. But we quantized electromagnetism. And, and by quantize, I mean really complicated physics stuff. <laughs> Uh, in the ways that you quantize this. There's things called the Schrodinger equation and all of this stuff that we're not going to really talk about very much. But the idea is you take a theory that is a classical smooth theory and you try and figure out what it, what it's like on a small scale. And there are two uh, sort of popular ways about going ways of going about this. Okay, One of them is called loop 
uh, quantum gravity. And this is sort of um, trying to quantize gravity in the same way that we quantize everything else, but it's complicated. It's more complicated uh, because general relativity is more complicated than electromagnetism. Um, so we're trying to do it the same way as ENM, but it's a little bit more complicated. And um, this is a, they're, they're getting really close to some predictions as well. Okay. And then another way is um, another, it's called causal. dynamical triangulations and this is heavy on the computer side of things and what it's doing is it's saying okay I have some smooth smooth chunk of space-time this is space-time and instead of <clears throat> Instead of trying to look at it in a smooth way, just cut it up into pieces, triangulate it in some way, okay? And then sort of look at how these triangles <clears throat> evolve. Sorry about that. How they evolve in a quantum mechanical way. So this is trying to use the power of computers um, to you, to look at quantum mechanics, <clears throat> um, and <clears throat> I just want to I just kind of want to put these names out there so you can see them, and we can talk about them more. But I just want to just throw all of this out here for you, right? Uh, general relativity describes things in a way where space time is nice and smooth. Okay, in quantum mechanics, we know um, should uh, sort of make it not so smooth. Okay. And one interesting thing here about loop quantum gravity is that the volume of space-time and area are quantized, which means that there's some smallest amount of volume or area. It turns out to be the area is about the size of the Planck length okay, on their sides. And so they're, they're quantized. Here in causal dynamical triangulation, you're sort of quantizing these pieces. But really what you what you end up doing is you're looking at the the thing that comes out as quantized is the curvature. So you only have remember how electrons had only certain levels they could be at in causal dynamical triangulation the thing is that the curvature can only be at certain levels. Okay, so this is kind of a survey of some of the the popular ways of uh, looking at quantum gravity. Okay? And there are other ones, <clears throat> there are other ways of, quant of uh, quantizing gravity. These two are both quantizing general relativity. And then um, the third way is sort of new, a, a new gravitational theory. Okay, and these new gravitational theories would lend themselves well to being quantized. Um, and one here is called, uh, there's a, one that's growing in popularity called shape dynamics. Okay, and these are just different, this is what well, the idea here is that some scale, you, your theory has to describe, it has to be really close to general relativity and it has to have it has to like overlap in a lot of places but the idea here would be well maybe we want to generalize general relativity in some way and there's some new theory out there that lends itself better to being quantized but still gives us the same numbers in the end when we look at big things but when we look at small things it it's tractable and understandable okay so that's sort of the way that theoretical physicists think about these questions and how they approach um trying to understand these big questions. This is why I got into physics, right? Because there's this big open question. General relativity is out there. We have no theory of quantum gravity, okay? And there needs to be one, and there should be one. There has to be one. There, gravi gravity exists on a quantum scale. It's just too weak for us to see it right now. And part of the problem with this, really, is that we don't, we don't have experiments where there are problems, right? We started figuring out quantum mechanics way back in the 1920s, when we started, well, even in the 
the, the turn of the century when we started getting numbers in our experiments that didn't match our theory. And we don't have that yet for quantum gravity because we don't have those experiments. So we're trying to get ahead of the game and trying to figure out what that is. Um, so, okay. Hope that uh, that's interesting to you folks. And I will leave you there. Thanks very much for your attention.